we at all day? It's going to be a good Tuesday, Elias. I'm telling you, we are. We got people rolling in. I'm ready. I'm excited because not only tonight we're going to talk about Saints news. We're going to have our first ever. It's a big experiment for us, so we'll have to see just how it goes. But we're going to have our fan debate night after the questions, uh, when the question and answer time gets started and when we get done with the news. That's going to be fun. we got plenty of news to talk about beforehand, though. And also, happy uh, Juneteenth to everybody out there. If you don't know what it is, look it up. Look it up. I mean, are we gonna are we gonna say happy Juneteenth and then tell them to look it up? Or are we just no, no, that was a, that was an opportunity. That was called a segue, and you're supposed to jump on that, and because I'm probably not the one that needs to be explaining it, and uh, you're here, and I haven't let you talk yet, and I'm still not letting you talk. It's it's so uh, evening, bro. Um, I don't know if you asked or not. I'm doing pretty well today as I sit on my green tea. Uh, Juneteenth, if you are not familiar, would be the uh, Negroes' Day of Independence um, when we were finally free of the shackles uh, of slavery, the the bondage of slavery. Um, And so Juneteenth is celebrated uh, by African Americans across the country. This is that day that it became official that President Lincoln abolished slavery. Uh, so that would be the detailed or not so detailed version. Yep. So happy Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth. All those out there watching. And just Thanks a special show. Yeah, look, I think it needs to be brought up. It's not brought up enough. I mean, because in America, we celebrate everything. In Louisiana, we certainly celebrate everything. Might as well start celebrating Juneteenth. But uh, Indeed. yeah, good stuff. Who that to everybody out there? I see Damon. I see Richard. I see Shannon. I see Irvin, I see the Dom, I see King Walker, I see uh, Color Retour, I see Coach C, I see Trey, Luke, uh, Shane, who's Dutar, Josiah, who that's all of you out there, G Brown, hope y'all having a fantastic Tuesday so far, because it's going to be a fun night for you. I see comments about uh, Elias' mic, we got positive news about that. A couple things I want to lay out there, I explained this on Twitch, I may explain it here. So when you guys do like a Super Chat donation on YouTube, we don't immediately get that. It actually takes about a month and a half to get that. So last week's donations was phenomenal. It'll be a while before we get those, uh, which that's just how YouTube does that type of deal. And also YouTube takes a 30% cut, which I didn't actually know that until doing some research after that night because I'd never seen donations like that. So uh, well, I actually told the Patreon supporters I'm thinking about maybe changing things up. But anyway, the mic has come in. Shout out to uh, Shane slash Dutar. Mike has come in. We're uh, piecing everything together. Elias will have a new setup in the next couple of weeks. We're crossing our fingers, and hopefully all the things will be improved. Anthony says, why does it take so long? Uh, just to answer that quickly because we got a lot of Saints news to talk about. The reason it takes so long is YouTube is set up through Google AdSense, which simply pays out every month. So until a month completes, you don't get anything. So like for June, it's going to be about the middle of July before any of that money actually rolls through, which is fine. I mean, don't bite the hand that feeds you. It's a blessing to get it. You know, uh, I'm not going to complain about it. But for those wondering, that's why like by Tuesday, we don't have a whole new like computer for a lot of setup. But we do have stuff coming. We got everything going. Anthony says get Cash App. I got the next best thing, man. I got PayPal. You want PayPal right there, baby. But yeah, that's why. But don't worry. Elias has got his mic. We getting the setup. And I'm excited because uh, not only are we getting set up, you get an apartment. Isn't that right, buddy? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to get out of the house, get an apartment. So that means I'll have the nice little table set up. I'll have my memorabilia in the background. Kind of look a little bit more familiar with yours, which should allow me a little bit more free reign. I won't be stuck here in the office um, until 8 or 9 o'clock doing the show. I'll be able to do it through the confines. <laughs> um, I'm excited about that. Well, speaking uh, of exciting things... I think a lot of Saints fans will join me in this. And this segue into our first big topic of the night. Delvin Bro is back in football. Now, he's not in the NFL. He's signing again with the Hamilton Tiger Cats. But he's just a guy you can't help but root for, especially with him being a boot boy. So it's good to see him getting back into football and signing with somebody, even if it's in the CFL. No, absolutely. It's nice to see him getting um, a chance. Apparently, what what – occurred is that he couldn't get clearance for his neck injury, um, which was a big sticking point when he initially entered the league. Now, if you guys recall, um, the Saints were one of the first teams to pounce on him. They probably had a bit of the home field advantage. 
uh, it was noted that there were a lot of teams interested in him, um, and yet the Saints got a chance to work him out very quickly, um, and then they signed him maybe like a couple of days later. So we never got a chance to really see uh, if other teams would have cleared him. Um, I think this is a good time to not only congratulate Delvin, but to highlight uh, how the Saints, um, as far as, how far they've come as far as injury clearance. Um, I do recall that was a time when we signed Delvin Bro. That was also the exact same time we signed Brandon Brown. And the Saints were pretty desperate for cornerback talent um, after missing on Stanley Gene Baptist and a lot of the secondary stuff, Champ Bailey, the year before. Uh-huh. Um, and so that almost represents like the height of when some of those injury clearance issues started to catch up with the Saints. Um, eventually, it ended up ending – uh, with the same player in Delvin Bro having the leg injury that the Saints initially cleared, um, and yet he was still not able to move around in that leg. Now, it's good that that has actually cleared up for him. It seems to be that that's not necessarily a problem or no longer was the issue. Um, but I thought it was just a good chance to highlight that the Saints have finally got to the point where they're no longer a desperate team that has to make a lot of those questionable decisions. Uh, we know that because they could have kept Nick Farrell. Um, on the field. They could have allowed him to play. Yeah. They could have allowed him to make the decision to continue to play. Um, and yet they didn't feel so desperate to the point that they needed uh, to set him up for that and, and, and have him make a bad decision or allow themselves to be on the hook for that, for a similar decision or the same decision just because of a need for talent, um, which at one point was very much not the case uh, during the rebuild process. So it's just it's good to see that they are no longer in that position. Uh, they're now a very deep team. They are now a very talented team um, that can now do best by their players and keep their, their the players' best interests um, in, in good scope. So I think that's a good thing. Wanted to throw this out about him in terms of his medicals. Apparently, he wasn't able to get past a lot of teams' medicals. Just go around. His back wasn't right. able to get cleared, and you know he got cleared by the CFL team doctors, and I just don't think a lot of teams were willing to take the risk. And you know it, it's a little bit more understandable, you know, if you go back in time three years ago for a younger corner, you know, if he clears with your team staff, you take the risk and, and, and see what he can do. But with him a little bit older, you know, uh, I want him to be successful, you know, but we'll, we'll just have to see how it pans out. He might go down as one of the best corners the CFL has ever seen. We'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Um, this allows us to kind of segue uh, while staying on the path of the secondary. Um, Joel Erickson has a wonderful piece out on the Saints' two mincy fresh DBs acquired in the draft, and they trail Jamerson and Cameron Moore on how their football IQ um, is helping them to navigate the learning curve. Yeah. Um, within it, it was mentioned that both of them, Aaron Glenn pointed out that both players play for college coaches that mix in zone as well as man coverage, uh, which gives them a leg up over a lot of other rookies because a lot of those guys in college play strictly man a lot of the time. Um, Jim Leonard, a former safety who also was known for playing in a lot of Rex Ryan schemes, uh, was one of the college coaches, probably added to a lot of the flexibility in that. Um, And one nugget that that Aaron Glenn actually dropped is the Saints' propensity to play match zone concepts, mm-hmm. um, where the play starts out as zone, uh, but ends up being man well, in the end. So I figured this would be a good time for yeah. to kind of drop some knowledge on them. Well, to give you a little background, uh, for those who don't know, Aaron Glenn actually played for three years under Bill Belichick. And for those who wonder where, because a lot of people probably heard about match zone concepts. I've talked about them a little bit here on the show. You want to know who invented those and the top two people who run them? Nick Saban and Bill Belichick, while with the Cleveland Browns, developed this system. Both run it very heavily. In fact, if um, for those who are Patreon sponsors, I I believe it was either last month or the month before, I sent out a gift uh, teaching on this, in fact, and how they call it for Alabama, their Rip Liz cover three matches, what they call their defense, and designating how they run it. 
basically it's simple. You you line up uh, depending on what you're running, maybe cover two, maybe cover three. Everything is zone, but depending on the routes that come at you. So maybe they throw you a four or they throw you a six route. Depending on your assignment, you're going to adjust to go to man coverage or zone coverage. And uh, that's how the match system works. And the Seattle Seahawks ran quite a lot of it. I don't know if they still are now that Sherman and everybody, everybody's gone. I'm not sure what they're doing up there with Pete Carroll at this point. But they ran a lot of match concepts. Bill Belichick will run them. Nick Saban with Alabama runs them. And now Aaron Glenn giving us a little bit of a peek into their playbook. That they also use those concepts. It's one of the reasons that you'll see guys like Crawley and Lattimore covering so much field and also sticking to players when the coverages look identical, which is great because just like how we talked about in RPO plays, you can give multiple looks and change things up. This allows the defense to do the same thing, add a layer of confusion to base off what the offense has given them. It's really cool. Yeah, and it does speak to what the defense is trying to do. I think Dennis Allen has made it uh, very obvious that he wants to add as much disguise and level of confusion um, to allow them to affect the quarterback and match zone actually feeds into that concept. Um, I need to do a film study on it. You should. Yeah, you actually should. Um, it's it's very interesting considering that not a lot of coaches have adopted it. Um, but as you pointed out, Nick Saban does run it heavy. When I started doing my research on what it was, um, a bunch of the articles actually use them um, as the quotes for it or the best examples for what it looks like um, when it's ran properly. And also the issues that pop up when it's not going properly. Um, so yeah, this is it's a very good topic. It's something to uh, so there are a lot of times people watch things on on film, see the thing going on game day, and it looks like zone initially, um, but then it turns into man, and so now you just have a little bit more information of what's going on there. Yeah. What we got next on so, the docket, brother? Uh, finally, um, the NFL Top 100. Yeah. Has made an appearance on the show again. Again. This time, Alvin Kamara checked in at 20. Um, the, the biggest thing I took from watching that entire video, since we were able to witness it, um, was I like to see what the other players have to say. And I think Mike Daniels elaborated it the best when he said that Alvin Kamara is lacking in weaknesses. Yeah. Oh, um, And I, I think that's like, that's kind of the speak of a, a, an elite player. Like, He's not. He doesn't have many things that he can't do. He can hurt you on so many levels of the field. Um, I think a common theme during the video was his ability to go limp um, at the point of contact, which the Panthers players pointed out several times last year when they prepared when they were preparing for him. Um, ironically enough, it was Panthers. It was former Panthers Jonathan Stewart echoing that sentiment um, and pointing out that Kamara was going to be special when he began to ask who number 41 was in the field. Um, his balance was also another talking point, as noted by the Packers DBs, uh, Morgan Barnett and High Clinton Dix. Uh, not too high at all. And I think anyone could agree that he was one of the top 20 players last year, easily. However, and this will allow us to start to segue into the question, it only makes it more glaring that Michael Thomas was not in the top 35 or 50 players. Because um, he should have been there at some point. But I think that the landing spot for Kamara is perfect. He was a very exciting player to watch last year, which is why he won uh, Offensive Rookie of the Year. I'm not surprised. 20 sounds good to me. I think that um, we could argue some serious snubs have happened way back in the 80s. Some serious snubs. But Mm -hmm. um, two things, two points. Offense in this league – gets way more attention than defense. I mean, you, you have to be a super, 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 superstar defensive guy to truly be respected, it seems. And the fact that he's able to do it all. So while there's certainly some things that Alvin Kamara has to improve on, and actually a lot of people have talked about the Saints talk about it, he has ways that he can improve. The fact that he's already so good in special teams, already so good in the pass game, already so good in the run game, simply so much he can do. I see why... This comes up because you compare him to other guys. I mean, you compare him to Freeman with Atlanta or Ingram with the Saints or, or even other guys around the league. One thing that he just simply has is that that ability to just be dynamite that not a lot of people have. And even if he's not as good in other areas as some running backs, is the fact that he has that dynamite level that most players don't have sets him apart. So I can see why he's here at number 20. 
Do would I put him in my top twenty players in the entire league? Personally, no, but I, I understand why he's there. And I think that is great that he's already getting that type of recognition. Now we just need him to follow up with it in his second year and see if he can even take it a step higher. But uh yeah, I think he can, I, I, I think he can too. I think he can. Um I I mentioned in the comments, mainly because he won't be winging it next year. He's pointed out that he now knows what to do on every play versus like Am I doing the right thing? Which means that it should also allow Sean Payton to expand the playbook and how he uses it um, and continue to move him around the formation, uh, which will continue to make him more dangerous because as long as Sean Payton uh, is calling the plays, designing the plays, he's going to put him in the proper position. And now that uh, Kamara knows what to do, um, his talent can take over even more um, as he continues to progress in the offense. So I think, yeah, I mean, and he's not, as somebody mentioned, Kamara's not slow. He is just a very patient runner. He's got a smooth running style about him. I think that's the best way to explain it. Like, it's, yeah. he, he doesn't take many false steps. Um, he kind of just glides. And it, he's not a 4 3 guy. Um, but one thing I have noticed is that he gets up to top speed very quickly. And then his speed is consistent. Like, it's not, it, there isn't a, he's got a third gear. But that second gear he gets to really quickly, and then once he's in it, it's stable. It's a very stable speed, and he can just continue to zoom by guys um, as he erases angles. So very excited to see what Kamara can do uh, this year. I'm actually less worried about a sophomore slump for him than I am Lattimore. Fair enough. So, guys, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go ahead and put the number on the screen. Here is how tonight's call-ins are going to work. Elias and I are basically going to take a backseat and play moderators. We're going to let people call in. We're going to maximize it, depending on how y'all interact with each other, to maybe two to three live callers at a time. We've had a couple of guys who reached out to us earlier that we're going to give them kind of the, the forefront. We're going to let them uh, do a lot of the talking. But everybody's welcome to call in tonight. So if you have something that you want to get said, you get to say it. And guess what? Deuce is keeping his nose out of it. Even if he, if he thinks your opinion is stupid and he wants to come and call you out on it, he ain't going to. If you say something silly, that's wrong. If you're talking about no team in the NFL runs 4-1-5 uh, coverages, I'm not four one six coverages. I'm not going to correct you. I'm going to say, sure, that's right. No, we're, we're going to let y'all have at it. Full fan tonight, and then we'll have a little recap towards the end. So, Phone number scrolling across your screen, 605 four, Okay, I might have to correct them if they say the dime coverage doesn't exist, which was actually a conversation on the Saints Facebook group page tonight. They said the dime coverage basically didn't exist. Neither here nor there. Four, <laughs> 405 Access code 299 We're going to get our callers in, and it's going to be up to y'all. The topics for tonight and the rules. Topics. Is Michael Thomas a top, top five receiver? I know Taven's going to call in for that one. I'm looking forward to hearing that, that phone call. And, guys, uh, as y'all start rolling in, I'm going to get you muted until we get everybody in. Is Michael Thomas top five? Who's going to make a slump? Who's going to be best? And who's going to stay the same? So, of the three rookies, well, the rookies going into next year, Lattimore, Marcus Williams, and Marshawn La and uh, Alvin Kamara. I just mixed up everybody's name. So, Kamara, Lattimore, Williams. You have to pick one to get worse, one to get better, and one to stay the same. You can't choose anything else. You can't say all three are getting better. That's the debate topic. And then if we have time for a third one, we will debate is Taysom Hill the future. So those are your starting uh, debate topics. Go ahead. Start calling. We got one caller waiting in the lines now. I'm looking forward to this. I hope it's, I hope it's uh, feisty. I hope it's fresh. And everybody better be calling in. 605-475-4892. Access code 299 3 Five, three. That's how we're going to start off the question and answer. We're going to get to our first one now. 985-713, who is this? This is Dom Lewis. How y'all doing tonight, fellas? I'm doing fantastic, Dom. Dom. How you doing? Doing all right. Can't complain. Can't complain? You ready for some debates? Uh, ready to do some debating around here. Yeah, I'm putting the call out there because I know everybody got hyped about this and then watch. We're going to have like three people call in. Everybody, everybody likes to talk a lot in the comments. When it comes to putting their voice out there, they get a little uh, cold feet. But we got the phone line down in there in the chat box. I'm excited, man. I want to hear y'all go at each other, especially with me staying oh, out. I'm ready. I did my homework. 
Oh, so we did some homework. Oh, oh that's, that's snap. Cool. I say, yeah, look, and everybody out there in the comments, I'm just going to say this. We ain't reading a single question during fan debate night. If you want to talk about it, Mark, uh, Michael Thomas is top five, you got to call in. I ain't reading a single question you got. None of y'all. And I love y'all. Start us off, Tom. Mike Thomas, top five, yes or no, and why? Uh, it's tough. It really is because – He's in his first few years. He's already done a lot. Uh huh. Um, in my opinion, I, I have a different system as far as everybody else when it comes to top five. As far as Michael Thomas being a top five elite player, I believe he is. Just because I also put character into the stance. I mean, he's definitely up there with Antonio Brown, Julio Jones, and uh, DeAndre Hopkins. For sure, because, you know, they're high-character guys. They don't really do much off the field. They just let their game do the talking. Uh-huh. So that's why I would put Michael Thomas in top five elite. And if other people would say, well, maybe he's not top five, but he's definitely right there on the outside. Well, we've already got a couple of callers in. The next one I'm opening the lines for, he's a regular. I know who it is, 225. It's KT. Where are you at on this one, KT? All right, let me say this. I got love for Michael Thomas, but he is not top five just yet. He's right there knocking on the door. He is a beast, but I still got to put A.B., Julio, O.B.J., DeAndre Hopkins, and Larry Fitzgerald ahead of him. He's coming. He's, he's in that I got next class. But as for top ten, yes. Top five, no. Cool, we got one more caller. And guys, y'all y'all gonna have to go at each other because I'm not saying nothing. Seven six nine, you're on the line. Who is this? This is Miss Football. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? Great. I uh usually don't call and debate football because uh to each his own, but I think Michael Thomas, I would say top ten also. He uh he needs to get a few more tricks in the bag. Uh, he need, you know, there's a difference between a number one receiver and then somebody who's on a team where they spread the ball. You don't get as much, you get attention, but you don't get as much attention. We got AK, we got everybody on our offenses, and we got Drew Brees. So yeah. Michael Thomas hasn't had to face what a number one receiver had to face. So he's good because he has surrounding cast to be good. Uh, and then you have Sean Payton calling the plays. I mean, look at Kenny Stills. He looked like he could have been a really good receiver. I mean, you have, you're part of a system. Now, can he have the potential of being the number one receiver? We will never know because he plays for the Saints. You don't have to have a number one receiver when you have Sean Payton and Drew Brees and Ingram and AK-41. So. Dom, you're the only one on the bandwagon right now. What you got to that? What you got to say? Um, I will agree with everything she, she just said. And I had a thought in my mind, like, since Sean Payton has taken over, really haven't had, like, you know, a number one, number two guy we knew when Marcus Colton was eventually, you know, the top guy, he was just like pretty much number one target. And that's what Michael Thomas is now. But there's really no state so on who's the number one, number two, number three. We pretty much just have a plethora of guys going out there doing their job. That's right. All right. Well, I'm not going to disrespect him like that. I do see the talent there to be a number one guy, but he's not that guy like Brandon Cooks or Reggie Bush or Jimmy Graham where mm-hmm. you say, Anybody else on that offense can beat us, just not him. Right now on our offense, that's Alvin Kamara. Anybody else on that offense, you throw any other wide receivers can beat us, but not AK-41. And with that, the only thing I can say I don't like about Michael Thomas is the fact Keyshawn is his uncle, but that's neither here or there. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all got to stay on the line because I'm loving the fire. We got the next one to bring in, 615-587. Who is this and what's your take on Michael Thomas' top five? This is Dr. Billy Oshie. I got to say he's a top five. The reason being is that he does what no other receiver in the NFL does, and that's everything. I mean, how can you not have a guy as a top five that mm-hmm. does everything? Oh, okay. I hate to interrupt mm-hmm. you, doctor, but – I haven't seen – show me a long touchdown pass of Michael Thomas's top where he's beating somebody like Brandon Cooks or Odell. Show me one where he's just caught it, turned up, and housed it. Now, 
route running, he is a technician. He killed Xavier Rhodes in the playoffs. But as far as that home run threat to do damage when the ball is in his hand, he'll get you a couple extra yards after a first down, but he's not housing anything. So to be a top five receiver, you have to be a burner? Is that what we're saying? Oh, no, yeah, no, no, no. I'm saying that, but look. Hey, uh, he is a burner. Julio's a burner. Look at Ryan the catch. The guys I named do have that ability, even Larry Fitzgerald in his older age. He can still do work in the slot and still house it if need be. Mm. Right, hold on. I still don't think they should qualify as being a top five receiver. I mean, just because you're able to house one every now and then, you know, it's to me it's all about the small battles. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. A top five receiver does everything. Please don't rule out blocking as well. Oh, no, no, no. Blocking is... Blocking I is do t- I do take just as essential as catching the ball. Yeah, I do take pres- – blocking, blocking does take precedence with me. That's why I always say Jimmy Graham is softer than drinking a hot bubble bath with two poor hot toilet paper. Yeah, I said it. But <laughs> with that, like I said earlier, nobody's game planning to take him away unlike the mm-hmm. other receivers that I did name. Well, at the end of the day, of course, he doesn't get that respect. But at the end of the day, he's what we have as a top one receiver. And he goes out and does it every game. And to be where he is as a second-year guy, he's only going to get better. I mean, name name another guy that you can put and line up anywhere on your offensive line, any type of receiver, Well, he's going to make a play. Let me, make, let me interject here because I want to do two things. We got a couple of callers. I want to get their opinion. I'm not throwing my opinion out there, but I want to. I want to throw a couple numbers for y'all to add to this debate. Yards after catch was brought up. Most people in this chat have said DeAndre Hopkins was a top five receiver, right? Most people have. Michael Thomas had double his yards after catch last year. He had oh, more yards after. He had more yards after catch than Larry Fitzgerald. Oh. Who are they quarterback? Yeah. I mean, I'm well, not Watson saying the quarterbacks are accurate, but I also have to, throw, that. have to throw this out there before I get the next caller. Look, look, if we look, use I'm the system... Nice. I'm, being, I'm being nice before Deuce disconnects me again. I'm not going to disconnect you, but this is y'all's time. night. This is y'all's night. I want to throw in one other thing, too. I agree with our lady who said the system thing, but I also have to point out, every player in this league, every single one of them is a system player. There's not a player, quarterback, receiver, who's not a system player. Every single one of them. Okay, can I can I interject on that one? Yeah, go ahead. Ooh. It's your night. I think I think I think that Michael Thomas is part of a system. Yes, every player is part of a system, but every player, every team. Let's talk about Atlanta Falcons. Let's talk about Julio Jones. At the end of the day, who do you want the football in hand if the game is on the line as a receiver? If it's Atlanta, you want Julio Jones to make the play. If it's if it's New Orleans now. So my, my thing is, Michael Thomas is a clutch player. Yes, he'll make a play. But mm-hmm. I'd rather have the game in Drew Brees and let him make the decision who to throw it to or if we should hand it off. So I'm not going to give Michael Thomas the top five receiver when you have a Hall of Fame quarterback. And a, what, what do they call uh, Ingram and, well, and AK-40. Oh, boom and Zoom. Okay, oh, well, let me hear you. You, you got all this stuff, you know. But you can't be a number said, one receiver. Now, hold on, Billy Oshie. Hold on. Matt Ryan. Hold on, Billy Oshie. Because we got a couple of these calls. We got to get them in here, too. Because we got to do some things. I want to hear what do some things says to what she just said. And, Billy Oshie, you can get after it. Man, before I get that, I don't want to pile up on Michael Thomas because I love that boy's reliability. He's going to catch that ball anywhere, everywhere. But I'm going to say something while I say it. I'm going to shoot a shot at KT just because he said he didn't like Keyshawn, and I love Keyshawn. But I remember <laughs> back in the gap when Tampa Bay won the Super Bowl and Keyshawn was their number one receiver, and he was telling right. the story to the guys in the locker room, and he was telling them how he was the number one receiver in the league. And uh, at the time, T.O. was killing things in the league, and everybody was considering T.O. the best in the league. And so – Keyshawn called Rich McKay, who was the general manager of Tampa Bay, over to the little crowd of people he was talking to. He's like, man, look, Rich, ain't I the best receiver in the league, man? Rich say, man, Keyshawn, I love you. Man, when you catch that ball, it's first down. 
But man, when T.O. catch that ball, it's touchdown. And mm. that's exactly where I see Michael mm. Jones. I mean, Michael Thomas missing. When he started oh, yeah. catching them touchdowns, because when I see uh, when I see Antonio Brown, it's a touchdown. Odell, it's a touchdown. Julio, it's a touchdown. Mm-hmm. Man, but when you see Michael Thomas, it's a nice catch, massive body mm-hmm. control, but usually it's a first down. Well, Michael Thomas, that it's barrier, a healthy run. I'll be honest with you. If you really think that, if Sean Payton actually gave him the chance to run those same routes, you don't think he'd be doing uh, yes, I think he would. Well, one thing, one thing so I want to throw out here. If you put that in, I think so. I want to throw y'all some more ammo to fight over with because y'all brought up touchdowns. Okay. And like I said, I'm not picking opinions. Michael Thomas has more touchdowns the past two years than Hopkins and than Julio Jones. But when you see, when you think about them, them replays and them, them highlights. You seeing Michael Thomas catching an amazing first down. I also say you're not that. seeing Dustin in the corner of the end zone. And that's fine. I'm gonna give you one more. I'm gonna give you one more. Julio Jones' best season ever as a professional catching the football, just catching 69.5 percent catch percentage. Michael Thomas' worst was this year at 69.8. Last year he was at 76. He's actually set a record for how quickly he's come out the gate catching the football. Y'all argue about that. One more caller I want to throw in here. We got plenty of them. 865-673. Who is this? What you got for the show? Come on, join this debate. Okay. You there, 865? You guys hear me, Deuce? Yeah, Deuce. What you got? What's going on? You there, 865? What you got? All right, 865 has some difficulties. We'll, we'll jump to our next one real quick before we get to everybody who's still here in the studio. 985-852, who's this? What you got for the show? Hey, yo, what's up, man? It's Tobias, a.k.a. Cold Chillin'. Out of here, uh, home of Louisiana, man. How y'all doing? All right, Tobias, good, so I'm, take I'm what everybody good, has yeah. said so far. I want you to give us your opinion on Michael Thomas' top five and then tell everybody else why they're wrong or why they're right. I think everybody's wrong that they, that don't have Mike Thomas in top five because you <laughs> have to be reliable in that. Uh, when Drew when Drew is on the third down, he's he's looking at Mike Thomas first. Every player is going to Mike Thomas other than if it's a running play. Uh, he really doesn't drop anything, so that's that. He uh, Drew is like a I mean um, Mike Thomas is like a blanket for Drew, something like uh, Jimmy Graham was. Plus, he has size and he could beat a lot of cornerbacks, just like he did Xavier Rhodes in the playoffs. Like Xavier Rhodes didn't want to nothing. Michael Thomas later on in the um like third and fourth quarter, and Drew Drew went to Drew talked to Mike Thomas um for the game running drive. He knew he had to depend on Mike to win that game. You know what I mean, sure. So I got Mike top five. Um, responses. All right, Cole. All right. It's a I'm question I got it right here. Oh, go ahead. All right. I'm just going to say this. I respect him. Like I said, he's not top five yet. He's six. He's knocking on the door, ready to kick it in. But like I said, nobody is scheming to take him away just yet like the other five we made. My point. Yeah. Well, yeah, they are. But they don't respect I'll say, that's, well, I'll say well, this. Well, that's respect. That's respect. That's uh, look, I'll say this. Like Defense is prepared against him a lot last year. It was very. He was targeted with high lows a lot. So you could maybe make that argument his rookie year when he had Cooks, but his second year, he was being prepared against specifically. Yeah, I just want to know who's the top five. Who's the top five? Because we've already dismissed Julio. You got to you gotta take you got to take Larry out there and put Mike. And, and well, let me throw this out there too. How much Wait. for y'all do y'all put in positional value? Because Larry, at this point in his career, is not playing the role of a split in anymore. He's playing a slot receiver. How much does that play and for he's y'all? A teacher. He's playing a teacher mm-hmm. position. He's basically a teacher for the, for the, for the upcoming Honestly, guys. I mean, if we're going to really go with receivers, why he can't throw Grunt in there because he's killing it and he's catching the ball just like everybody else. We ain't getting into that whole Jimmy Graham, no, Brock we, House, no, that, no. we can't do it. Uh, I want I, I want to I want to say something. I want to say something about Larry Fitzgerald. Okay, Don. This man has been, this man has been playing for 14 seasons, right? Yeah. Did y'all know that he had 109 catches last year? Mm-hmm. Oh, he was a steal. Oh, mad respect. But, catch- but also in 14 seasons, he's had nine 
1,000 yard seasons. He's only at five 100s, but his catch percentage is 60.4. That's still a pretty good average for somebody who's played 14 years. That's beautiful. And he's he definitely top five. He's consistent. He's in my consistent. book, in my book, he is. Why? Because he yeah. does something that no other receiver does in his game today, and that's block as well as he does. He is the best blocking receiver in the NFL right now. Well, I think then if that's the case, then Michael Thomas jumps right up there. Yeah, Mike's right there, too, because you can't have a good running game without your receiver. Yeah, there's plenty of time. Can I I just make a a point about something? Yes, ma'am, you can. Uh, Michael Thomas hasn't been in the league long enough to be a top five, I believe. Okay. Right? Because... You have to you have to earn your stripes. That's in any any sport. I'm not gonna give a rookie rook. I'm not gonna give a rookie an MVP in basketball. You you gonna have to earn. You gonna have to earn it. You gonna have to go through some challenges and some trials. Okay, Michael Thomas haven't done that just yet. Give him some time. Give me a Super Bowl ring. Then he could be top five. You know I what? Feel like, man, I feel like I feel like Mike has. She preaching. She preaching right now. Okay, because I'm gonna yeah. say oh, everybody, everybody ain't nobody named the top five yet. So I'm gonna just well, throw mine out there just so we have five names. Okay, throw them out there. Antonio, throw them out there. Oh, Antonio, Antonio Brown. Okay, go ahead. Mm-hmm. No, it's Antonio already Antonio Brown. Okay, Antonio Brown, Julio De- Julio Jones, Odell Beckham, uh, DeAndre Hopkins, and Larry Fitzgerald. See, I'm wow. I mean, we, but we already dismissed. And, and if you, I mean, on, I mean, you can't put Larry, I mean, you can't put DeAndre Hopkins out when he's been having Tom Savage throwing him the ball. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. do some things. Elias, Elias has got something. Hold on, hold on. I have a hard time figuring out how consistency doesn't carry over to the NFL. Because that's the thing. Odell Beckham Jr. consistently staying in the top five after missing a year is just as egregious as Grunt being in the yeah, top 100 after missing a year. Odell needs to drop out of the top five right now. After yeah, and season. can you really can you really trust Odell in the postseason? You can't trust yeah, Odell in the postseason. You can I trust Michael. That, you, you know, they got to get there first. Yeah. That, that's clearly got more to do with hype than anything that he's – because the NFL is always known as what have you done for me lately year. And yeah. after, after – lately uh, – and, and Od- after missing a year – he hasn't done anything for me lately, so I find it, it egregious that he well, continues to stay in mm-hmm. people's time. Well, let, let me say this too. But further, now, I want to add this because historically, and guys like Antonio Brown are the exception. The size that Odell Beckham is does not necessarily fare well in the playoffs. Smaller receivers struggle more against top end defenses in the playoffs. That's something I think that's been a knock for Odell because he's dominated in the season. He has 200-yard receiving games, but is he doing it against Xavier Rhodes? You know, I, I think that's something that's been brought up a lot. Y'all can debate whether that's valid or not. One thing I want to see, I want to see if all y'all will agree on this point because I like that she brought up that he has not earned enough stripes yet. If you compare his first two years against all these other guys we've talked about so far in the top five, he's a top five. Game do y'all over. think that he is better in terms of his first two years start <laughs> top five, than those game guys? Over. <laughs> Absolutely. Bang the gavel. So, yeah, therefore, we have to use it. Oh, you got to play top five. Oh, play top five. Oh, he's, he's, had a good, he's had a good few years. That's what I say. No, I don't think top five. Let's not good two years. He's, he's broken well, so, yeah, records. Yeah, it's record-setting record. two records. years, As though. Yeah. He's so you say he was rookie of the year when? No, rookie oh, setting rookie record. Of the year. Oh, okay. Rookie of the year is about exciting. And, 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 and Mike will kiss record. And Mike broke his record in two seasons, man. Right. No, don't get here, – here's what I want to say. He has done a phenomenal job. He's a great receiver. You can't, you can't knock on the stats. Yeah. Okay? But to say he's a top – I, that's where you're saying LeBron is the next Michael Jordan. You know, this is just ridiculous. Every, you know, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I like her. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this. I'm gonna throw who I would put above Mike Thomas right now, personally. I would put Julio. I'd put AB. I would put and I, I would put Hopkins. And then everybody past that point is up for debate. And I have about five names I could put in that remaining two spots. Thomas is one of those names. Uh, we got one caller. We got one more caller I want to add to the debate line before we have final thoughts on this topic and move to a next one. 318, you're on the show. Who's this? And what do you think about Thomas as a potential top five receiver in the league? Oh, what up, man? This is your boy Trey, you know, from Monroe. And I, you know, I was just disagreeing, you know, with the, you know, with the woman on here. Like, 
how could you say he need more strikes and need more time? When you seen Odell his first year, you knew he was mm-hmm. one of the greatest in the league. Like, that was... Because he caught like, one hand? Ooh. No. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. She bringing the heat. I like Ooh. her. Ooh. Ooh. Just, that was just a question. Just a question. I mean, because I, mean, I did that the other day. No, that was more than a question. That was a whole subtweet on this show. <laughs> Man, I, I can't put I can't well, put Odell over Michael. I can't I can't put Odell over Michael because Odell uh, choked in the playoffs. You'll never see Mike choke in the playoffs. Now would you agree, Sean you Payton? You'll never see that. I got one question. Somebody brought up Tom Savage being DeAndre Hopkins' quarterback. If that's the case, then we got to give Drew his just due. You can't single somebody out for a quarterback or anything else. Hey, your job as a receiver is to produce. I don't care if it's three yards. I don't care if it's eight yards. Turn it into something. That's your job. And if you want to say that, Mike is the man. Mike's the man. I actually actually want to add something to that point about Hopkins. In 14 and 15, he had over 1,000 yards. And in both years, he had four different quarterbacks to him. And yeah. still got a thousand yards. Two thousand fifteen, yeah, he had fifteen hundred yards. So. Gerald's whole career. He, he might be number two after. Should we years. give him a cookie for doing his job? No, his job mm-hmm. is to produce. <laughs> well, I'm saying that's, no, that's, that's, what, makes, that's what makes I'm you in the league this year when you got four different guys throwing no. you the ball and you get fifteen hundred yards. That's Drew insane, Mister Consistency. <laughs> I'm sorry, I apologize that we actually have somebody that can stay on the team and stay healthy. I apologize. No, really, I don't. What I do say is that at the end of the day, it's all about what you're doing. And Mike, Mike at least finishes. I'm pretty sure. I'm not a stat guy, but I'm pretty sure he probably finishes close to the top five in every statistical category that we have yep. running. Ain't so, reliable. What, what oh, more of a so, oh. again, reliable, like, forget strikes. Strikes don't, don't mean strike. nothing. If you're doing your job, does that mean that somebody that's been there 15 years on the job deserves a promotion if you do your job and do their job better? No, it don't. You do your job. That's what you're paid to do, your job. So he went out and did his job. His job is to be a top five receiver, and he is. Hmm. Okay, I, I don't disagree really? that he does his job. I don't disagree that he that he's doing a good job. Great, but you have Drew Brees throwing to you. And the reason why it has to be striped is because – a great player is a consistent player. And you have to exactly. consistently show your game over right. not one year, not two years, not three years. You have to be a top. Now, y'all say Fitzgerald, okay? Fitzgerald, oh. he, could, he could catch one ball next year, this season. He still would be one of the greatest receivers of all time. Okay? Mm, of course. Michael Thomas, he going to catch on, one ball on. next year. Yeah. Y'all hold, hold on. Call- Y'all going to get on this radio station and uh, this YouTube uh, channel and say he is garbage. <laughs> hold on, hold on. I'll, no. I'll say something. No. I want to make a, di- a no. note of difference here. If Larry Fitzgerald only catches one pass, he's still one of the greatest of all time, but that doesn't mean he's a top five receiver that year. We're talking about at right. this year, going into 2019, is he a top five say? receiver? Uh, Larry, oh, I believe Mike Andrew, will be Andrew, this year. Larry might fall off if he only catch one pass. But so again, I'm pretty pass. sure he was in the top five. All right, for every hold on. Every guy's a category it. this year. All right, here's what we're gonna do. To I'm gonna quickly mute everybody. Okay. So- Quickly mute everybody because we're going to transition to our next topic because we'll talk about this one all night long. And this gives you guys and gal a second to prepare. We're going to talk about his Taysom Hill got a chance in Snowball, Hades everything to be the NFL starter and heir apparent. I want to, because Elias has just been sitting back enjoying it. I want to get Elias's final thoughts on that topic before we move on to the next one. I mean, I think, you know, I, I agree with the fact that he needs consistent to do it, but I also see a lot of uh, contradictions. Like, OBJ is a top five receiver, but OBJ did it for three years. And then yet I heard it takes more than three years to do it, yet he's being listed in the top. Consistency is a big part for me. I also think that uh, Thomas is being handicapped because of who his quarterback is uh, and who his play caller is. And yet I think that Thomas has been what everyone wanted Colston to be. Everyone wondered why Colston yeah. did not make any Pro Bowls. It was actually because he was part of that system and Sean Hilton. Thomas is just a dog. He's a beast. He's led the team in targets with. He didn't have, did he lead the team in targets his rookie year? He did lead them in targets yeah. last year. 
Um, and so to me, that qualifies as a number one receiver. He's the go-to guy in the clutch moments. He's who they've drawn the plays up for when they need a third down or a big play. Um, I think he's undervalued to an extent, and yet I do agree that we need to see a third year from him. All right, so here's what we're going to do, guys. I'm going to start unmuting. We had Matthew McClendon, one of our supporters, call in towards the end of this. I want to get his quick thoughts. He's going to start us with the Taysom Hill discussion, and then all of y'all are going to jump back in as I unmute you. Uh, I wasn't trying to be rude. We just got to keep this moving so we can make sure everybody gets heard. Hey, Matt, how you doing tonight, man? I'm doing good, Deuce. Good to talk to you, man. Uh, give a little shout-out to White and Florida Lee. You know, you want it, they got it. Uh, I just want to kind of say, you know, some of these takes that y'all have on Thomas, you have to realize that, you know, teams, they said teams aren't playing Thomas. They're not scouting Thomas to be this one guy. Teams are doing that. They're, he's going up, just like you said, he's going up against Xavier Rhodes. He's going up against their best tight ends. I mean, their best cornerbacks and drawing double teams. The man is getting played. Deeper safeties are hovering over the top of him. So, yeah, he's not breaking <laughs> off huge touchdown plays, but he's getting the ball to the end zone. He's catching it in the end zone when he has to. They're, he's doing what he's asked to do. The man is elite talent, has been since college. If you don't believe that, why do you think Sean Payton drafted the guy so early? He, he's the number one guy for us. He's top five in the league. All questions asked, answered right there. You, can't, you cannot come in and play for the Saints and outdo Julio Jones in touchdown passes. You can't put Odell in there. He stays hurt. He's a walking Band-Aid. Uh, Hopkins <laughs> don't have a quarterback. You want to talk about Keenan Allen? We'll talk. You want to talk about A.B.? We'll talk. You trying to put some of these other guys in there? They ain't staying healthy. They ain't got the quarterbacks. They're not on the right teams. So to be a top five quarterback, I mean a top five receiver, you're going to have to have all the intangibles and be in the right system for it to work for you. Now, if you want to talk about Taysom Hill, I think he's unproven. He's got a lot of talent. Can he run our system a certain way? The way Sean Payton likes it, maybe if he's here for three or four or more years Ooh. under Drew, can learn the calls, can learn how to adjust to defenses and read safeties and, and do the right things as a quarterback, maybe. But I just don't see it. I think it's the next guy we draft is probably going to be looking for a quarterback in the next year. This draft or the next draft would be the guy, the quarterbacks that we really need to focus on. And uh, the question you talked about earlier was who's going to get better, who's going to stay the same, who's going to get worse. Um, you know, I, I, I see – I feel like Williams regresses a little bit. I think Lattimore gets better, and I think Kamar stays the same. Okay. Now, All right, let's that's see. That's kind of what I called to say, but I, I feel like some of these colleges got to step their game up. They're too into arguing. They're trying well, to – Well, I mean, that, that's, what, that's what we did, man. I, I swear I, mean, I, I won. Let, let, them, let them have at it. It's fun. It's all in good fun, man. I get it, but maybe you just need to mute one of them so they quit stepping on each other until <laughs> yeah. they're done. It is a learning process. I, I'm enjoying it so far, but we're, we're working. I appreciate you calling in, and uh, I'm glad that you remind me about my second question that I completely forgot about. So, All right, guys. Well, I'm at work, and I'm not going to be able to stay around, but uh, y'all have a great night, and who that to the crowd. All right. Who so, so here's what we're going to do, everybody. We're going to start off. Uh, Dom, I'm gonna start with you first because you're first on the list. We'll go KT, our lady who has become the queen of debate night. Uh, Billy Yoshi, do some things. I'm gonna go down the list, so guys, don't worry. We'll get to you. I'll call you out when you're unmuted. Dom, since basically we're gonna start off with this, uh, you can hit the Taysom quilt, Taysom Hill question first, or you can go ahead and hit um the uh, who's gonna be better, who's gonna be worse, who's gonna stay the same question, whichever you want to start us off with. Your call. All right, I'm going to go ahead with the Taysom Hill question. Um, I haven't really seen much on him as far as, you know, film is and how he actually produces in a game. I did watch a little bit of a highlight clip. Most of the things I saw was just him making big runs, and I saw that his sophomore year he had, like, over a 1,000 yards rushing as a quarterback. And I do see his mechanics when he throws is a little bit on the, you know, iffy side. Mm -hmm. And also a thing for me that factors in, he's 28 years old, going into his second year. He's got speed. He's got good size. It's just I'm not too sure. I mean, it's like as much as I want him to be the heir apparent, 
I just don't see it happening. Maybe the stopgate to the heir apparent. But, I mean, I can't really say much until I actually see him in play with the team. All right. We'll bring in KT next on it. What do you think about this one, KT? Okay. As far as taste on Hill, I'm just going to say no. I haven't seen enough. And, honestly, if he was really that much going, he wouldn't be on special teams. I think we – I do agree we'll find our quarterback of the future coming in the draft. But right now, I don't even have him as a stopgap. I see him as a more athletic Garrett Grayson. Ooh. Ooh. I'll take that still. All right. Billy Yoshi, you're on next. What you got for this one? What you think? Oh, wow. Um, first and foremost, uh, Taysom Hill. Yoshi, I you're on next. Uh, not that I don't believe in him, um, and I don't believe in Sean, but I just haven't seen enough for him. Um. Now, I think that he is a stopgap just because of his age, but he could surprise us and end up being a, a late bloomer like Kurt Warner. So yeah. that's always in the back of the table. And remember, at the end of the day, the draft is about finding what best fits you. So I think he gives us some time. Now, as far as regression goes, to be honest, um, I'm thinking that we're going to have a, um, a real big – progression from our uh, defensive line this now, year. Look, man, that, that's not the question, Billy. You can't you can't <laughs> cheat out. You got to pick one to be better, one to be worse, and one to stay the same out of Kamara, Williams, and Lattimore. You can't say they're all getting better. You got to shoot somebody down. Who you shooting down? Who you putting up? Lattimore goes up. I think Kamara goes up. Nope, you only pick one. Williams. Nope, can't do oh, it. Man, you, one has to go up, one has to stay the same, one has to go down. I think Williams goes down, Lattimore goes up, and Kamara stays the same. Okay. Yes. Next up, we got to do some things. What you think on this topic, man, or these topics? Man, on that uh, taste on Hill thing, I'm going to trust history and trust Drew. I mean, trust Sean on some things, and I know – I'm not sure if my memory served me right, but it seems like the last few years, the second-string quarterback has always been in-house before training camp is started. And mm-hmm. if that holds true this year, then one of the three people they have on their roster, they assume that they second-string. And if it's one of the young guys, you have to assume that if not a second-string, they're looking for him to be at least a starter sooner or later. And so okay. I'm going to believe that they actually see something that takes some here that makes them believe that they don't have to go through the same process they went through the last few years. They have who they're looking for. If he can pair it out. One thing I do like about him is he's healthy. He's playing well, healthy on special teams. I like that you note his health because health was actually a serious problem for him in college. Uh, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, his five seasons at BYU, he only reached 12 or more games, or in fact, he only reached – six or more games three times. His rookie year not really counting because he's not the starter. It's a lot of things. Okay. But that's definitely part of it. So, like, 2015, he only played in one game. 2014, he only played in five. 2013, he played the full season of 13. And 2016, he played the full at 12. Tobias, we're going to get your thoughts on this before y'all. We'll just let you guys go out and debate on it, though it seems like most of you are agreeing. What do you think about Taysom Hill? Um... Sean Hill, I think he's just I think he's just better to fill up space. Uh the two year oh, contract that they gave Drew. Oh. I, the two year contract they gave Drew, I think he plays after those two years, honestly. I think he plays at least one more good year and the last fourth year is just gonna be his walkaway season. I think they draft a quarterback, if not next year or the year after. After we win the Super Bowl, a lot of people are not gonna be expecting us. Somebody's going to drop down to like 32 or the second round or something. We're going to pick somebody up. Are we going? To, or, or like what Sean Payton does a lot, he just be aggressive. He just trade up for whoever he wants. You know what I mean? So I think I think a lot of people just uh, hyping him up. I don't think he's I don't think he's our guy. All right, so we're going to uh, do one more caller, and then you guys just go at it. Y'all can debate. Y'all can argue for about the next six minutes before we wrap up the show. Five four one. You're on the show. Who's this? What you got? Uh, this is Nolan, and for the who goes, who are ascends, and who goes a little bit, and who stays the same, I'm going to go by just work ethic. To me, there's just no way Marcus Williams is going to be worse. Okay. He's going to be the best of the three. Same Kamara. 
I'd say I've seen some bad things for his work ethic this off season. I'd say he stays the same. And then Lattimore, I'm not hating on Lattimore, but because I know he's still dealing with an ankle injury. But as far as Kamara and Williams goes, I have not seen him put in the work that those two have. On Lattimore, but and then for Taysom Hill, obviously as a Saints fan, I'd love to say yes, but. Here's a lot. I think here's something that I think a lot of people don't know is supposedly in like 2013, he was he was a Heisman Trophy finalist or like not a finalist, but people were projecting him to be a finalist. And then yeah, the four season-ending injuries that obviously led to being undrafted. So to me, he's not. He, yeah, he's an undrafted free agent, but he's different because he has shown talent, but yet there's a the injury history to me is the only reason why he went undrafted. Mm, okay. Interesting. Well, let me throw this out there because now, now the floor is open for all y'all guys because I like that you bring up that he was considered that because he was. In fact, uh, I think it was Virginia linebacker. I'm trying to remember his name. Uh, Virginia linebacker is one of the ones who came out and said that, that he's the guy to watch. I'm blanking on who it was that said it. But one thing I want to note about Taysom Hill that I don't think a lot of people realize, his TD to interception ratio is actually pretty abysmal. 43 TDs to 31 INTs. That is not something you typically see of, you know, very well-touted quarterbacks coming in the league. Doesn't mean he can't be successful. It's happened before. Y'all take that ammo and y'all debate amongst yourselves. KT, you want to go first? Give it up. Yeah, well, with Taysom, like you brought up, it's kind of gonna it's gonna kind of be hard for him to be the quarterback of the future when he finally gets his chance. He'll be in his thirties, so it's gonna be a very small window. I see him more as a stopgap more than anything. I do think he's a smart, heady player that can pick up the playbook and digest it. But as far as him to be the next dude to take over the throne after Drew Lees. I don't well, see Yeah, I don't see that. Let, let me throw this out there yeah, to yeah. you. And like I said, this isn't me taking sides. Steve Young was 31 when he took over for Montana and became an all-pro and a pro baller. And I'm not saying Hill is that guy. But I'm saying that quarterback yeah, is a position that hits right his prime. Right that, that was a different NFL. I think, yeah, I think a lot of people expected Steve Young to, to be next. That was expected, yeah. I believe. Yeah. I don't think people expecting Hill to be that guy. You know what I mean? And I love Michael Thomas, but he's no Jerry Rice. Mm. Mm. Hey, also, Kurt Warner was 28. So it happens. That's the goat right there. But y'all have it? No, keep going. Keep going. I like it. I don't think that he's – here's my thing. I don't think that he can't be. He just has a really tough heel to climb. He's 28 right now, and he's at least about two to three years away from being where – we would need him in order to be our franchise quarterback. That's the problem. Can that we puts him at 31. Can we all be yeah, in and pray that he beats Tom Savage for the backup job? Definitely. Y'all still doing a lot of yeah. big going curve on him. Yeah. That's a I large going curve. It shouldn't take him no more than a year or two when the system will start picking it up. Yeah, I, mean, I, would, I, would agree. I would agree to that point as well. But, I mean – if you're going to sit behind somebody, it might as well be Drew Brees. Mm-hmm. But even even at the worst, he still sticks around the team and becomes a special team. You put him on defense the way he runs down the field. <laughs> I'll take him any day on defense. Couldn't right. hurt. I'm going to throw out some more, and this is to add to the debate topic before we wrap up the segment. Does sitting behind Drew really help? Because is Drew going to want to teach his replacement? We saw Peyton Manning refuse to do it. We haven't exactly seen Drew do it. He actually was one of the reasons Gary Grayson's gone. He ran him off. And do we really believe that Sean Payton can develop quarterbacks because there's not really an example of him doing that? What do you guys think? As far as the, the thing with Grayson was, he just he just all, he was so unaware of what was going on around him. Like, Plenty of times watching him in preseason game, he just looked lost. Like, he never thought about stepping into the pocket. And I, I believe I heard that Drew was pretty much just schooling him in the classroom. That's that's true. Uh, Billy, mm-hmm. KT, what y'all think? I don't, I, well, with that, I don't see Drew as Brett Hart, whereas it's not my job to teach him. Drew was mentored by Doug Flutie in San Diego. So, I think. Drew isn't going to take that mentorship like I'm going to take you by the hand. Drew is going to challenge you. If you want to take my job, young fella, come on. 
challenge yeah. me so I can challenge you. Iron sharpens yeah. iron. Yeah. What you think, Tobias? I, I, I think Drew. Um, as far as being Drew being a teacher and and um, Sean Payton um developing quarterbacks. Yeah. I have to see it, man. I have to see it. I I haven't seen. We have to hold on to the quarterbacks that we draft. Usually, when we pick them, we just we just let them go. Um, I need to see us hold a quarterback for a while other than Drew Brees. Um, I don't. I really don't trust JT Barry. I don't trust none of the guys on our roster other than. Drew that's why I feel like we're going to get another quarterback. Maybe this is just like a test, maybe to see what we have before next year. Because I feel like if we needed a quarterback, we would have drafted one other than Davenport. But that's not really a, a top priority this year. So I think it's just to maybe give it a, a backup just in case Drew go down. Like Luke McCown did when we played Carolina. I feel like Luke could have won that game if it wasn't for uh, Josh Norman with the interception. But uh, – like I said, we I think we're gonna get a quarterback next year or the year after. Okay, Matt, I, I know I you're know, sitting man. down there. Hold on, I want to make sure everybody gets their opinion before we um start closing this out. Matt, you got any thoughts on that? The past two things we just talked about. I don't think Matt's Matt Matt uh yep. might be muted there. Anybody else got any thoughts on Sean Payton and Drew Brees as yeah, mentors? I, well, I think this. I do see Drew in that mentorship capability. The only thing I see with the Saints, and history has shown this, not every team is going to draft an Aaron Rodgers or Andrew Luck. You need to have that young quarterback in stance. I'll give you a key example, two key examples. Look at the Broncos after Elway retired. They're still looking for a quarterback. Look how long it took the Raiders to find Derek Carr after Rich Gannon left. You can't be complacent in, with what you have. You need to aggressively go out there and just keep swinging until you find a quarterback. Because if not, it's going to be a lot of dark days ahead. All right. That is true. That is, that's a very good point. That's probably that's probably why a lot of folks thought we were going to get uh, Lamar Jackson in the draft, but we had a pass. That's what shocked the world. A lot of people thought we were getting Drew replacement this year. Once we picked Little that report, a lot of people like, okay. I don't need you subtweeting me on air, Tobias. I'm right here. You you can just say it. Nah, nah, nah. nah I wouldn't even pay attention, man. What what you mean? What you mean? <laughs> I, I think at the end of the day, I think at the end of the day, I think Drew will mentor him just for the simple fact that Drew knows at the end of the day that's the type of guy he is. Like of all the guys you could ever see, I kind of see Peyton Man being like, "Nah, I'm not gonna mentor you." Drew's that guy. Yeah, we got an offense. It's, it's a Southern Hospitality offense type way. You know what I mean? Like Southern you don't Hospitality. Turn around. Uh-huh. You know? mm. Well, we tell don't you turn what, guys. Around, yeah. I think we've had a great night. We are at the hour mark, so I'm going to have to wrap it up. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and mute all y'all. I got to say thank you to everybody who's participated tonight. I thought tonight went pretty well considering it's our first time. That we haven't done this whole thing before. Me and Elias, for the most part, just kind of chilled back. I do have something exciting to say. Because while you guys were debating, cool news. Guess who I just got done talking to, Elias? Somebody you mentioned mm-hmm. earlier in the show. I, 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 I mentioned a lot of people. Good. Okay. Green Bay Packers defensive tackle Mike Daniels. Just got done talking oh, to him cool. a little bit. So uh, I reached out to him and said, hey, would you be willing to talk a little bit more about Alvin Kamara, what made him so dangerous, and how y'all game planned against him and stuff. And he's agreed, so we're going to set that up. And uh, I don't know if it's going to be on the podcast or if it's going to be something we pre-record. Nice. But you guys will get to hear from a, an opponent last year and one of the better guys in his position in the league on what it was like to go against Kamara and how they actually prepared to do that. I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, man, that's that's epic. I I really like Mike Daniels and the way he plays the game, and uh, he usually gives extremely good insights. Um, but he's I I just like nasty players. I think Mike Daniels plays the game the way you you want to see uh, your guys play it, especially on the defensive line. So any 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 opinions that he has uh, has I I pretty much respect. So that's that's pretty that's gonna be pretty dope. Man. I like that. Dude. Yeah, I was I was pretty excited about that because that um like on a whim I reached out and said, "Hey, I wonder I wonder if we can get this set up because I thought that the quote that you put out about Kamara's number 20 and that was one of the big things that got said that he has no weaknesses. I want to dive deeper into that. I want to see where that comes from. Inside of that steam. Mm. 
<laughs> Key says I'm the plug on the low. Look, guys, I'll say this, and this ain't me throwing shade, but it's me throwing shade. Ain't no other podcast giving you what we give you. Ain't nobody giving you the film, the interviews, none of it. Not saying some of them can't, but we doing it. That's all that matters. We here for you. We just make it happen. Man. Yeah, that's it. I'm saying we do make it happen. Oh. I'm just a bystander. Shane, I didn't realize that was you muted. Hold on. I feel bad. Shane's been sitting at the bottom. I didn't unmute this last caller because we honestly didn't have time, but if it's Shane, we got to get Shane here. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I didn't realize it was you, but like, I couldn't just keep accepting callers. We go two hours, but... Well, I mean, maybe you need to go two hours. <laughs> Can you please relax? Hey, man, this one, this, this, oh, I'm doing great. This this went well. This went well, fellas. I... I, I, I I, I gotta say that man, man, wow, we got some informed fans, don't we? We do. Yeah, we do. Yeah, I, I thought uh, it was a real I good night. Since, since I spent a, one of the smartest. Yeah, well, since I, I spent a little while muted, man, I got to listen through my phone instead of my computer, which is kind of new. Uh, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna just jump out there and, and jump in with the uh, Michael Thomas thing real quick. And my, my opinion is, man. <laughs> there, there, there's a pretty good argument for both sides of that, but if you take Michael Thomas and you put him on a team with any of these other top five, top ten receivers, who's the number one? I mean, that's the question because, yeah, Fitzgerald, he's one of my favorite players of all time, but you put him on a team with Michael Thomas, Michael Thomas now, Fitzgerald in his prime, it's – that, that's that's where you got to answer the question. I, I I don't even have an answer for that one. But, I'll say this: I think uh, what you're saying goes it. back to what our lady was basically talking about earlier. He hasn't hit his prime yet. He doesn't have those stripes yet to see what his prime really is. I think that's some of the people's reservations about putting him top five. Correct, correct. And another thing, uh, maybe the second topic was uh, Hill. Man, we, we could argue this all day long, but I mean, nobody knows. Nobody, and not even the Saints coaches. I mean, if we really thought he was the future, we wouldn't even brought Tom Savage in. We wouldn't be bringing J.D. Barrett. We would just be bringing camp arms and, and just handing the team over to him over the next couple of years. And, you know, I, I don't think that you can say one way or the other right now with him. I mean, it would be even hard to have an opinion until we actually see him. Um, and then your third topic was if uh, – Oh, which guys are going to regress? Which guys are you know? Which guys are going to uh, continue? I, I think that Michael. Tom, uh, oh boy, I messed up. Uh, mm. Marshawn Lattimore stays the same. Okay. I, I can't see him going backwards or forward. I mean, how do you beat what he did last year? I mean, I think he was one of the best cornerbacks in the league. So does Pro Football Focus and everybody that watches the game. You're not going to beat that. And cornerbacks have weird stats. I mean, how many times, you know, your guy caught the ball, um, tackling, whatever. I, the, the biggest compliment a cornerback can have is does the quarterbacks throw at you. Um, so if they throw at him less, his stats are going to be less. But, you know, he actually did a better job. Um, one thing that could make that better is if, say, Crowley actually improves on his ball skills, starts getting some interceptions, well, then they have to throw at him or, or what have you. Uh, P. Rob takes away the slot option, uh, that kind of thing. Our linebackers play better. But I think he stays the same. I think his athleticism, his size, his speed, the way he plays, that's not going to change. Um, Kamara, I could see him going back and still being very effective. Uh, going back stat-wise, just because key, teams are going to key on him. You, you've mentioned before that um, teams – didn't really throw six, seven, eight man boxes at Camara. Whenever he came on the field, they brought out their nickel package, and he had a you know a little bit more running room. Um, we're going to get to see in the first four games possibly him face a little bit more of a uh, defense structure to stop him from running. Um, plus, we have some more pieces in the passing game that might let him uh, you know be a decoy more often. But I think he could go backwards and still just be as good as he was last year, but just go backwards, 6.1 yards a carry, uh, 14 touchdowns. That, that's, that's tall. That's tall. To reach that, it's going to be hard. Um, but moving up, you can't convince me that Marcus Williams will not blow up this year. 
You're just not going to convince me of that. Mm. So that's all I got. I like it, man. I like it. With it. We were having a discussion earlier, so I, I'm kind of privy to everything that you already discussed already. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I, I know where you are with a lot of things right now. And for those who uh, haven't checked it out, Shane out here actually put out his own little article on Saints Report today. He, he's trying to take myself and Elias' job, so y'all go check that out. <laughs> Never in a million years, brother. It's just a boring season, man. <laughs> <laughs> it is that time of the year, man. Look, I appreciate you calling in. Thanks, bud. All right, All right Elias. We got to wrap it up for the night, man. What you got for us? Man, it's – I don't know. I, I, I feel like since I'm – I didn't say much today. I didn't have time to develop. Uh, live your life. This is the best advice I can give you. Live your life for you, not for anybody else. Not even your parents if they live vicariously through you. Um, sometimes they can uh, maybe try to push you in a, in a proper direction because of possibly bad experiences that they may have had. And they may not want you to make those mistakes. And the probability sometimes changes just because they may have seen uh, one thing on their side of the, the spectrum that hurt them doesn't mean it's going to respond to you. Sometimes paralysis by analysis is a real thing that can happen. So always live your life based on the decisions that you want to make and the things that you want to do. Um, and allow yourself room to make mistakes because uh, the best teacher in life can be mistakes. Um, yeah. We always like to point out that um, you don't have to put your hand on the stove to know it's hot. And even though the philosophy may speak to trying to not put your hand on the stove as often as possible, sometimes touching that stove and realizing how hot it is can be a much better teacher than not touching it. Um, so as always, we love you guys. Um, we will be back on Thursday. Love the segment. It went off wonderfully well. We've got oh, some so of the most informed fans in the league easily. I think the Saints is not only a very passionate uh, fan base, but Definitely a very informed fan base that does their research. I think they spoke to the first caller calling in like, yo, I did my research, which means yeah. I'm not going to give you some mumbo jumbo, which I found wonderful. Um, so when we come back on Thursday, we'll have some, some more topics for you, a little bit more news. Remember to smack that like button. Remember to share out. Please share out, share out, make people know about this. Put people up on the Saints podcast. Dudes pretty much hit it the best. Nobody's doing what we're doing right now. Nobody's bringing the fan interaction. Nobody's bringing you the interviews. The insight is lovely. Everything is wonderful about this show. So share it out. Make people know about it. With that, love you. We'll see you on Thursday at 7 o'clock. Sharp. Who that? Who that, guys? Had a great time with y'all tonight. We will be doing this again. It was a lot of fun. Don't know when, but it will be happening. Make sure y'all come join us Thursday night. And... If y'all want to get with us, hit us up on Twitch, hit us up on Twitter, hit us up everywhere. Who that God bless, and we'll see you on the next one. Bye.